And uh, so if you have a copy of the Word of God, if you'll turn with me to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Verses 13 through 17. I'll give you a moment to get there. Sometimes those uh, little books aren't uh, easy to find. James chapter 4, verse 13 through 17. Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanishes away. For that you ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. <clears throat> but now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. What is your life? I've often uh, pulled that verse of Scripture out of context and used it during a funeral. And uh, when I say, what is your life? I sometimes say, uh, what would you like for me to say to uh, people? I, I do this quite often. I'll say, what would you like to me to say at your service if you want me to do it? And of course, that's a kind of a joke. But anyhow, I want to talk to you tonight on one life to live. One life to live. Uh, when I use this at a, a, in a funeral, I say, what do you want people to remember you most for? What do you, how do you want people to remember you? What kind of a life have you lived? What kind of standards do you live by? How long have you been serving the Lord? How faithful have you been serving God? And... Uh, so I've used that quite a lot. I know I take, kind of take it out of context, but what is your life? How, or how do you want to be remembered? Uh, I told my wife Meredith that, uh, and I always thought I would go before her because in 208, 207, actually I got cancer and uh, they found three tumor, uh, six tumors, malignant tumors. They were able to take out three of them, and they couldn't get the other three, and I guess they're still there, as far as I know. But I do take chemo if, uh, for that. But uh, anyhow, I always thought Meredith, uh, I would go before her, so I told her uh, many, many times that when I did pass away, I wanted her to put a box of Bojangles chicken in my casket and my golf putter. But I didn't get around to doing that and now I wished I had a, put that box of Bojangles chicken in her casket and my golf putter because she's going to be waiting on me when I get there. You'll get it in just a minute. One life to live. James four thirteen through 17. One life to live. Uh, if you're taking notes, and some people like to, uh, I'll give you mine after I get through. But not now. I need them. I've always uh, used notes, and I especially do it now, because I don't remember well. For some reason or not, I don't know why it is that uh, I've reached 82 and I don't remember as well. Not a word in the house. I thought you was going to say amen. <laughs> Just for your knowledge, I was born December the 16th, 1940. 
Now, how many of you uh, were born before that? No, don't tell me. <laughs> one life to live. Now, if I've just got one life to live, then I ought to make it be the best life that can possibly be lived with God's help. Is that true? Okay. So here we're going to go. If you're keeping notes, and uh, I'll, I'll make this clear for you so you can take uh, down the points and so forth and so on. This is the way I've always preached. Uh, I like to use points and things that will help you. And so when I look down at my paper, I'm looking down at my notes. One life to live. First of all, I want you to talk about the duration of life. Verse 14. The Word of God says life has an appointed duration in Hebrews 9, 27. The duration of your life. First of all, life is short. Ask any senior citizen in here and they will tell you life is short. It seems like no time that I grew up in a little place called Whitnell and uh, we lived on a small farm and uh, we had a horse and a mule and my daddy plowed with it and the old horse's name was Fred and, I, and he called that old mule many things that I can't say. You'll get it. We raised our own chickens. My mother used to kill the chickens and uh, she'd put them in a pot of boiling water and pluck the feathers and so forth and so on. Uh, we raised our own pigs. Uh, I bought my first pig when I was 15 years old. And me and my brother, after it got a little bit bigger, we went to riding that sucker down in the hog pen. But life is short, and you can ask anybody. It seems like no time till I got to where I am now. Meredith and I had been married 63 years when she left this world. And uh, I hit 82 December the 16th. But it seems like a vapor. Seems like a short time. And some of you in here know what I'm talking about. So some of you are probably a little older than I am. Some of you are not as old as I am. But it really came in a hurry. I mean, I got to 82 before I knew it was going on. So life is short. And you can ask any senior citizens about that. Number two, life, however, is significant not only is life short but it's significant it appeareth for a short time as short as life is it makes its own impact in terms of behavior influence service and sacrifice you know you're not promised a tomorrow I'm not promised a tomorrow so if you're going to serve the Lord serve Him faithfully Today and every day, each day, do all that you possibly can to hold high the blood-stained banner of the Lord Jesus Christ. It does me great joy to go into a place. I did it just today to get something. And I said, well, I'll tell you where it was. If It was down in Hickory uh, where they serve some soft-serve Stuff. Me and my son went down there and I said to the woman that waited on me, I said, I want to tell you something. Jesus loves you. Do you know that? And she said, yes, I do. Yes, I know that. So serving God is a, a privilege and uh, we need to understand how important it is because we've got one life to live. One life to live. And so we need to understand it's significant. First of all. And then, as short as life is, of course, it makes its own impact in terms of behavior. But then there's influence. Influence. Then there's service. And then there is sacrifice. The fact that vapor ceases to appear doesn't mean that it ceases to exist. And so death is not a cessation of life, but rather a change in its form. Death means heaven for the believer, hell for the non-believer. If we knew, if we knew we only had a week to live, 
only one week to live or a month to live, how would it affect our lives? How would it affect your life if you knew that you only had one week to live? I hate to keep bringing it up about my wife's death, but she knew she was dying. She knew she didn't have long to live. And uh, she knew that every day was an important day. She knew that every day, that possibly it could be her life's day. And she lived her life the best that she possibly can. She couldn't get off the couch. Uh, We had to help her push her in a wheelchair when she did have to get off the couch. But she begged to die. She said, I don't want to live like this. We never know when we're going to leave this world. And that's the reason we need to understand we've only got one life to live. Please excuse me, pardon me for giving you this uh, bit of information. The morning that she died, uh, she uh, woke me up about 5.30 in the morning and she said, would you come around here and and uh, help me with the pillows that I have to sleep against. She could not lie down in the bed. She had to sleep sitting up. And uh, so I just walked across. She said it as calm as I'm saying it now. I walked across, around the bed, and I got her in my arm like this. And uh, my son and my daughter heard us talking. And so it's 5 or 30 in the morning. And so they came in to the bedroom, and... My son climbed up on the bed and he helped straighten up the pillows that she uh, <clears throat> had that she had to have to give her support to her back because that's the only way she could sleep. And then, as I said, I had her in my arms just like this and she pointed her finger, little bony finger, right here and she said, I got a pain right here. And she died. She was gone. So, see, we've just got one life to live. One life to live. What's the duration of your life? You might live to be as old as I am, 82. You may die young. I've had to perform funerals, and I know uh, Brother Robert has too, of, of young people and just children. We never know how long we have on this earth. The important thing is to always be ready. You may get killed in a car wreck. You may have a heart attack. You never know. Always be ready. Be prepared. Know Jesus as your personal Savior. Make that all-important decision to receive Him as both Lord and Savior. I remember 1964 Mother's Day, and I've told that story here, I think. After driving home, about every night from an American Legion dance, half drunk, not knowing where I was going. I had a wreck. Many times people would follow me from the American Legion dance here in Hickory, follow me home to make sure I got home okay. But as I went, I'd see three highways in front of me not knowing which one to take. And so I see I never knew I never even thought about the fact that one of those trips could be my last trip. And had that happened to me, I'd be in hell today, no doubt in my mind. Mother's Day 1964, my mother said, I want all of my children to be with me in church, five of us. My mother had seven children. Her first two babies died. Five of us left. And she said, I want uh, all of my children to be in church with me today, Mother's Day, 1964. And I told my wife, Meredith, I said, that's the last place I want to go. I don't want to be in no church. Absolutely, I don't want to be in church. I don't want to go. But just to satisfy my mother, I'll go. My mother was a godly woman. When I was just a little fella, we'd have a family altar and she'd gather us around. I, I hated it. We'd have a family altar. All the children would come around and she'd read the Bible to us and tell us about Jesus and pray for us. And I hated that, Brother Robert. I didn't like it at all. 
I was just a kid. I wanted to play. I wanted to do something else besides hear my mother pray. But Mother's Day 1964, Meredith and I went to church that day. Brother Fred Price was preaching at Community Baptist Church in Whitnall. And when that altar was, that call was given, the Holy Spirit of God got a hold of me. And I flew to that altar and fell on my face before God and accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. The duration of our life. You see, I could have died before then. God kept me on this earth. Although I was crazy, He kept me on this earth until that day when I went to be with my mother on Mother's Day. And that day, He saved me He forgave me of all of His sin. He filled me with His Holy Spirit. And it wasn't much longer after that that He called me to preach His glorious Word. Will you give God a hand clap? Life is short. But number two under that point is life is significant. It appeareth as a short life, and it makes its own impact in terms of behavior, influence, service, and sacrifice. Life is significant. What are you doing for Jesus tonight? Have you witnessed anybody lately? It gives me great joy to be able to tell somebody about Jesus wherever I meet them. Dr. Percy Ray used to come through our community uh, do you remember Dr. Percy Ray? And he was a great preacher from Myrtle, Mississippi. Uh, he was an old man then. And if somebody would say, Dr. Ray, would you pray for me? If he was on the street corner, he'd say, yes. That's the way he talked. And he said, get down here on your knees. And if he was in the middle of Lenore or middle of Whitnall, well, if he was in the middle of Whitnall, there wouldn't have been much on each end. But anyhow, he'd get you right down right then. And pray for you. If it was a prayer to be saved, if it was a prayer to be healed, whatever kind of need that you had, he'd get down right then and pray for you. The duration of our life is that it has an appointed duration. Zig Ziglar was a great Bible scholar in Texas that I used to follow quite often. As a matter of fact, a whole lot. And he made this statement, and I don't quite understand it, but I know that he made the statement. He said, God set our death date before He set our birth date. God set our death date before He set our birth date. Now, I can't explain that, but all I can tell you is that life is short and life is significant. And we need to understand that. And, in, of in course, in, in the area of behavior and influence and service and sacrifice. If we knew we only had a, a week or a month to live, how would it affect our lives? Some foolishly live as though we will be here on this earth forever. Let me tell you something tonight. Unless that old trumpet sounds... Oh, Gabriel blows his trumpet. Tonight, you're going to die. I was preaching a watch night service one night for Wayne Borders, Zach's Fork Baptist Church in Caldwell County. It was called a New Year's service. That's what we used to have, New Year's services, to bring in the New Year, pray the old year, old year out, the New Year in. And I was preaching that service that night And I said, one of these days, old Gabriel's going to blow his trumpet and we're going out of here. And I said, it could be tonight. And this was not made up. It was not planned. And about the time I said, old Gabriel could blow his horn tonight and we'd be going out of here, somebody blew a trumpet outside. Scared us all. Uh, I thought, oh, no. (laughs) The duration of your life. 
it has an appointed duration. I do believe that every person in here has an appointed day to die. I thought mine was some years ago when I was pastoring at Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. And uh, they gave me, as I said, three to four years to live, but I'm still alive. Brother Robert, I don't know uh, if I quite understand it. There's a Messianic Jew, I'm, I'm sorry, an Orthodox Jew prayed for me that I'd be healed. When the doctors were saying, I better plan to die, I better get my house in order. I bet they'd get everything done that I was going to do because I was going to die. As I said, I had six malignant tumors. And uh, I had a robot to operate on me. You ever had a robot to work on you? Now I'm going to tell you what I told the doctor that uh, operated that robot. And some of them are going to get mad at me. And if you do... Uh, you can ask Jesus to forgive you. I asked him, I said, before you operate on me with that robot, see, he cut holes all made a big old circle right here, and about, I don't know, about ten holes in my stomach. And I said to him, I want to know one thing, or two things. I said, is that robot a Republican and a Tar Heel fan? He didn't say anything, so I don't know what it was. All I know is it cut holes in my belly, and I had to have stitches, and so forth and so on. But I'm telling you some things, you know, about my own life, because there is a duration to our life. It has an appointed duration. It is appointed unto man to die, and after this, the judgment. I hope every one of them is in here live at least uh, to be as old as I am. I never dreamed that I'd ever uh, live to be 82 years old. I grew up on that farm, the little farm we had. had a horse and a mule. And uh, we, had a, we raised hogs. And I bought my first pig when I was 15 years old. But what happened though, me and my brother used to ride that old pig. Did you hear me? Didn't have no saddle on it either. We rode that old pig. We did. All, you can't believe the craziest thing, crazy things that we did. Oh Lord, how mercy! But you see, God had an appointed time for me to die. God has a set time for me to go. Doctors said it's supposed to happen years ago, but God said, "No, I've got an appointed time for you to go." You see, the thing about it is, I don't know when that appointed time is. And you don't know when it is that God has appointed for you to die. And that's the, the, the meat of my message tonight, is that we've got one life to live. How are we going to live it? Then I want to talk to you about the danger of your life. Not only the duration of your life, I want to talk to you about the danger of your life. The supreme danger of our lives is to live it. The supreme danger of our lives is to live it without God. And this is the easy day that we're living in that people simply are so tied up in humanism they have missed the fact that there's danger in our lives. Number A, living selfishly. When we take our time and talents into our own hands, we have dethroned God and enthroned self. If God has gifted you to do something, you need to do it. If it's teaching the Sunday school class, if it's singing, uh, singing in the choir, uh, whatever it is that you have a gift to do, you need to do it. You ought to be honoring God, bringing glory to His name. But the danger of our life is that we live selfishly. We live for ourselves. We don't live for God. We don't live 
for others. We live for ourselves. We, and so we just take our time and our talents. I don't sing very well, but I love to sing. When I pastored in Morgan, we had a quartet that I sang in for 40 years. And uh, it was a good one too. At least three of them were. <laughs> but we sang to glorify the Lord. We sang at church. We didn't go down the road. We didn't go over yonder to the squire. We didn't go you here and yonder and yonder and here and yonder. We sang in the house of God. We sang to bless God's people. We sang to praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people live selfishly and they don't do that. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, We are bought with the price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is God's. Then there are so many people who live sinfully. There's no greater sin in this universe than of willfully ignoring, neglecting, or rejecting what we know to be right. So many people live selfishly. What's the most important thing that you can do is to serve Jesus, is to honor Him, is to tell others about Him. How I love to do that. Everywhere I go, I tell people about Jesus. And I tell them about what He did for me. I went to work for Coca-Cola Company here in 60 and 19 and uh, or here in Hickory in 1961. And uh, I got with a group of people that uh, I thought I was supposed to live like them, and I live like the devil. But I'll tell you something. I'm so glad that God straightened all that out. Sometimes we live selfishly. We live to please ourselves. We do what we want to do. Now, I'm not going to be ugly, but this place right here ought to be at least half full tonight. At least half full. Now I realize that some people work late. Some people have to go to work early in the morning. I understand all that. And then some people are like me. They're old and they don't feel like coming. But the house of God ought to be full. We live selfishly. We live selfishly. And that's the danger of our life. Is sometimes we live selfishly to please ourselves. We don't care about anybody else. We don't care about God. We just live selfishly. But then we live sinfully. There's no greater sin in this universe than that of willingly ignoring or rejecting what we know to be right. One of the greatest sins that we can do, one of the craziest things that we can do is to sin willfully when God has been so good to us. The duration of our life. Life has an appointed duration. I might die before I get home tonight. You might too. You say, preacher, you're scaring me. I don't mean to do that. I'm just simply saying we're going to die. Unless that old trumpet does sound and we head out of here. The rapture takes place. I kind of believe we're close to that, Brother Robert. I don't believe we're away far off from the rapture of the church when we'll all meet the Lord in the air and forever be with the Lord. The first person I want to look up of obviously is Meredith. The second person I well, really, Jesus. Let me go back. Jesus. Uh, of course, he's going he's gonna to come for us. So the first person that I want to see is her. The next person I want to see is my mother and daddy. They both were children of God. My mother was a godly woman. My daddy was a godly man after he got saved. And I want to meet them. But uh, then there's so many other people that I want to meet. Uh, but we live so selfishly sometimes and that we just willingly ignore uh, what we know to be right. Uh, I've talk to people about doing things that's wrong and they say I don't care don't make no difference to me I don't care I live my own life the way I want to well you can I used to live my life the way I wanted to 
when I was just a kid and my mother beat the devil out of me with an old cherry limb. Now, none of you have ever been whipped with a cherry limb, have you? We had three or four cherry trees out beside of our house. And when I, when I was mean, and I was, my mother told me one day, said, you're the meanest human being I believe I've ever seen. And I said, I'll have you know I'm not a human being. And I wasn't but 10 years old. Has anybody ever told you you're that mean? The duty of your life. If the supreme danger of our lives is that of living without reference to the will of God, then the supreme duty of our lives is living with reference to the will of God. And this involves uh, two important aspects uh, of human responsibility. And then I'm going to finish in just a few moments. The duty of your life. What is it that God requires of you? What is your duty? What's my duty? Well, God called me to preach, uh, but that's not just necessarily just the only duty that I have. Uh, I've already told you I have the duty to tell others about Jesus. I have the duty to sing His praises. Uh, I have the duty to do a lot of things. Uh, and so we need to understand that, acknowledging God's will. There was a time when, as I say, people routinely talked about the will of God, but sometimes they don't do it now. The entire universe, all of creation, obeys the will of God, except man. Man is the only created thing in this world that has a desire to do the will of God. The only thing, the only thing is knowing God's will and doing it. We need to acknowledge God's will. And it's plainly our duty to acknowledge God's will through prayer and the Scriptures. And when God real, reveals His will to us, we must accept and acknowledge that will as sovereign and final. Accept His will. What's God's will for you to li uh, your life tonight? Do you know? Do you have a talent of some sort? It may not be singing. It might be playing the piano. It might not be playing the piano. It might be witnessing. Uh, some people can, it just uh, seems to have uh, a stronger urge and uh, whatever you might want to call it to tell other people about Jesus. Being bold and telling other folks about Jesus. Whatever it may be, teaching a Sunday school class, as I've already said. What is it? Acknowledging God's will for your life. And it is our duty to acknowledge God's will. We can do it through prayer and we do it through Scripture. How often do you read your Bible? How often do you pray? Do you pray daily? <clears throat> you might pray several times a day. And I'd, say, I'd almost say that most of us pray more than just one time a day. I get up praying. Before I get up, I'm praying and asking God to bless people. And uh, I sleep with an old CPAP machine. Anybody know what a CPAP machine is? Well, you stick that sucker on your face. It's got a mask. The thing goes over the top of your head. And you put some water in the reservoir and put it in a pump. And you turn that pump on and it blows... Uh, air and water up your nose all night long. And they told me if I didn't do that, that I'd get Alzheimer's. Uh, I could very well get Alzheimer's. Or maybe something would happen to my brain. And uh, I've been doing that for several years, and it's not working. <laughs> You'll get it in a minute. I wake up praying. When I wake up of a morning... I take that old mask off, or at least I take, the, take it loose from the pump itself, and I lie in the bed, sometimes for 30 minutes, praying, praying for you, praying for Open Door Baptist Church, praying for Sean Davis, and that's the truth, praying for pastors everywhere, praying for God's children everywhere, praying for our nation, praying for the lost, 
and on and on and on. And then I pray at other times during the day, and I'm sure you probably do that too. And then at night time, when I go to bed, uh, I pray, I pray, I pray. I try to spend as much time as I possibly can on my knees before the Lord, telling God what I'd like for Him to do. And that is, touch people's lives. Save precious souls. And of course, God wants to do that anyhow. But I pray for people. I pray for folks who are sick. I pray for people who don't have a job. I pray for the poor. I pray for those who are homeless. And on and on. One of the worst things that I can even imagine is being homeless. Every day, every day, and this is the truth, I pray for people who are homeless and hungry. People who are homeless and hungry. I'm going to tell you something about Jamie Torres. Maybe he's never told you. And that's one of the reasons that I pray every morning and every night for the homeless and the hungry. There was a time that Jamie Torres was homeless. He didn't have a home. He didn't have anywhere to go. And he slept in a junkyard in an old Volkswagen. And he didn't have anything to eat. <clears throat> he told me that he used to eat out of uh, trash cans of places like McDonald's and, and uh, places like that because he didn't have anything to eat. And so ever since he's told me that, every single morning and every single night and sometimes even during the day, I pray for the hungry and the homeless. If you don't listen to anything else I say tonight, please listen to that. Pray for the homeless and the hungry and pray for the lost of this nation and pray for our country. Now we can uh, criticize the uh, political uh, thing that's going on in our nation. We can criticize the president. We can criticize uh, Congress. and We can just be critical. We can criticize anything and everything. But listen, we need to pray for those people, even if we don't like them, if we didn't vote for them. We ought to pray for them, that God would use them, that God would speak through them, whatever. But we have so much to pray about. And so, uh, it's God's will for us to pray. God's will for us to pray also is to pray for people to be saved. People to be saved. I also pray every day for folks to be saved. I can't stand the thoughts of somebody dying and going to hell. I can't. I don't care how mean they are. I don't care how, uh, if they're drunks or whatever it may be. I can't stand the thoughts of anybody dying and going to hell. And I pray every day, every single day, morning and night, sometimes during the day for the lost, that they might be saved. <clears throat> I used to cut up and have a big time before I ever got saved. I'd dance and jump up and down and do all kind of old crazy things. But I'm so glad that somebody prayed for me, that my little Christian mother my mother wasn't but about uh, five, she was uh, under five feet tall and didn't weigh about a hundred pounds when she died. And that's about all she weighed when she was alive. But she was a praying woman, boy. And she prayed for me. I didn't realize that she prayed so much for me. But she prayed for me. She prayed for the rest of her children. And every day I try to pray for the lost. Not only just the hungry and the homeless, I pray for those who are lost because <clears throat> if they die without Jesus, they're going to hell. I'll tell you something. Two times before God saved me, <clears throat> I dreamed that I died and went to hell. True story. And I woke up both times shaking like a leaf. Scared me so bad. And I just... I could see myself falling into hell. And I could hear people screaming. Screaming to the top of their voice. They were in such pain. 
and such agony. And it and it wake me up in the middle of the night. I'd be I'd break out in a sweat. Uh, we call it sweat in the country. <clears throat> and it would just scare me. But I didn't do anything about it. Second time, I dreamed of hell. Same kind of dream. I could see people in hell. I could hear people in hell screaming and hollering and going on. I didn't do anything about it. But I'm so glad that my mother was praying for me that I wouldn't die and go to hell and be there forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever throughout all eternity in hell, in torment. Oh, listen to me. Accomplishing God's will, first of all, is to be saved. And then sanctification. It's God's will that Christians grow or become more like Jesus each day. That's called sanctification. It's God's will that Christians grow or become more like Jesus each day. Would you like to become more like Jesus? Would you like to love like Jesus? Would you like to care like Jesus? Would you like to care for the sick and the dying and the lost like Jesus did? It's a privilege of mine, and I've told this before, to go to Israel twice, and both times we walked up to Via de la Rosa, and that's the, that's the street that Jesus walked up on His way to Calvary. And up there was Calvary. You could see Calvary. As we walked up that street, up there's Calvary. And we, all, we walked all the way up to the foot of Calvary, but the Arabs control that part and we couldn't go up there. But I looked up and there were some crosses up there. We couldn't go up there. But I could, in my mind, I could see Jesus with all that blood running down off of His precious body, out from where that crown of thorns had been mashed down on top of His head, and where those nail prints were in His arms and in His feet. Oh my goodness. And then I, we walked just a little piece over to the left, and there was the tomb where Jesus was buried. They say He was buried in that tomb, and that's pretty well sure that that's where He was buried. <clears throat> I got to go in that tomb, Brother Robert. And I thank God for Calvary. And I thank God for that old tomb because one morning the old earth began to shake and He came out of that tomb. And He came out of that tomb to save me from my sins. He went to the cross to die to save me from my sins. He came out of that tomb to die, uh, to live, to call me from a life of sin and save me. God's will operates in three areas. Salvation, sanctification, and life's of service. It's God's will that we serve Him and serve others. It's His will that we serve. I'm sure there's something in this church that you could do. And I'm sure Brother Sean would say, yes, we've got plenty uh, of things you can do in this church. I don't know what it might be, but service, to serve Him, to serve God, you can serve Him at home. You can serve Him out on the street. You can serve Him anywhere you go. But you can serve Him. I always had trouble as a pastor finding somebody who wanted to teach Sunday school class. They wanted to do anything as far as that's concerned. And I'm, I don't mean to be mean, but that's just the way it was. You had to beg them, you had to plead with them. And uh, it ought not be that way. If you love Jesus... With all your heart, you ought to step forward and say, hey, what can I do? Is there anything in the church that I can do? Where can I serve? How can I serve? Can I sing in the choir? I don't care if you sing like a frog. If you'd like to sing in the choir, get in there. Whatever it is that's needed in this church, you ought to ask the pastor, Brother Robert, whoever, can I do that? How about ushering? Whatever. Serve. What is your life? That's what I'm asking tonight. And I've tried to share three main points with you in talking about what is your life. And I'm going to go back to my notes. The duration of your life, 
the danger of your life and the duty of your life. First of all, do you know Jesus? Might be someone here tonight that's never been saved. One story in closing. Is it time, Brother Robert, to get off of here? I'll tell this one story. When I was at Community Baptist Church in Whitnall, we had a, <clears throat> they came out with this movie called, uh, it was about death and about fire and so forth and so on. And uh, I played it, and I showed it in our church. And uh, a fellow that I went to high school with, and I just preached his wife's funeral last week. I preached his funeral. We went to high school together. He was one of our deacons. And when I gave the invitation that day, Burning Hell, that was the name of it. I knew it would come sometime. The Burning Hell. I was standing there as I gave the invitation, and my dear high school friend preached his funeral, his wife's funeral, but they both living then, knelt right there. And I said, Brother, can I help you? Can I help pray for you? What's your need? Now listen to me. We were in high school together. I never knew him to use a word of profanity. I never knew him to drink any kind of alcoholic beverage. I never knew him to do anything wrong or bad. And I said, uh, what can I help you with? His name was Bruce. And he said, preacher, or Larry, I don't remember what he said. He said, I've never been saved. One of our deacons, he said, I've never been saved. He said, I've just been playing church. I've been telling everybody I'm saved. I've been serving as a deacon and I've never been saved. And he gloriously gave his heart and his life to Jesus right there that day. Might be someone in here tonight. You've been coming to church here for a long time. Come every service. It might be you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Savior. And in anything I do, I want to give you an opportunity. So as we bow our heads and close our eyes, I'm not going to take much longer because I know our time is about up. Maybe it's already up. There may be somebody in here tonight say, Preacher, I'm kind of like that, <clears throat> that fellow. I've just been good all, all my life. I've never done anything real bad. I've never, you know, never used profanity. I've never used alcohol. But I've just never accepted Jesus as my personal Savior. First of all, if there's anybody in here, nobody looking around, you'd raise your hand and say, Preacher, I'm not a Christian. I've never been saved. Anybody in here? I do this a lot. Sometimes people say yes. I want to raise my hand and say I've never been saved. Anybody in here that's walking at a guilty distance from the Lord? You'd raise your hand tonight and say, Preacher Klein, would you remember me in prayer? Just pray for me. It might be that God's talking to you about doing something special in the church. And you're kind of anxious about it. You're holding back on it. Whatever it may be. And you'd raise your hand and say, Preacher, yes, I see there's, there's the hands. Any others? God's wanting me to do something. Yes, I see the hands. I see the hands. <clears throat> yeah, many hands gone up. Uh, I've been praying about doing something in the church. Would you pray for me? Anybody else? Anybody else? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that you've allowed me to stand here tonight and just stammer around. And uh, I hope that I have spoken words of truth that has touched someone's heart and maybe blessed somebody. And so I pray for these who raise their hands, you know their hearts, and just touch them in a very special way. Give them a special anointing of your Holy Ghost. A special anointing of your Holy Spirit. And help them to make that decision and make it soon. Whatever it may be that it will bring honor and glory to you. For it's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Brother Robert, do you have anything?